Hartosh felt the warm blood begin to pull onto his legs as he held his friend in arms. It was all his fault. He had been too slow to dispatch the big soldier, and now his comrade was bleeding out in front of him. He had failed once again. He had cursed himself the previous times and made a vow that he'd never let this happen again. Yet here he was, with his last squad mate dying in his lap. And it was all his fault. His friend looked up at him. The, the panel. Bring me to the control panel. Hartosh looked to the control panel to the steam generator, softly lit by the feigning lights. They were sent to overload the generator and blow this part of the train station. It was supposed to be a quick and easy mission, one where both of them got out alive. Hartosh looked back down in tears, now welling up in his eyes. I, I can't. I won't leave you here. Echoes and many footsteps came from one of the corridors. Do you hear that, Hartosh? More are coming, and we'll both be dead if you don't leave me. I'll hold them off as long as I can, then blow the generator. You have to, to survive. Someone does. Hartosh closed his eyes for a moment. They are out of time. Tears streamed down his face as he dragged his buddy to the panel and propped him up on a chair. He then grabbed his steam rifle and ran down the hall for the exit. He ran as fast as he could. It took all his mental and physical strength to do so. He only hoped that he could run fast enough. After a few moments, he heard a sound that chilled into his core. He turned around just in time to see a wall of hot steam rush down the corridor and quickly engulf him. Then he woke up. Tuchilukic standing over him, shaking him awake. Hartosh, wake up. I think we've arrived. Hartosh sat up and looked around at the metal walls of the massive flying machine they were in. The constant rumbling of the engines had noticeably calmed. Looking out of the window he had been laying beside, he could see that they were in fact on the ground and slowly moving across a concrete field. Large buildings could be seen on the other side of the field. It was reminiscent of Fort Chassier, minus the large walls. However, there did seem to be a strange tower near one of the buildings. Maybe it's also a sort of defensive tower like back home, he thought to himself. The terrain outside was very different from where they had been before. Instead of rolling hills of tundra, they were now in an ocean of forest. Mountains in the distance could just barely be seen peeking over the treetops. As the vehicle moved and turned, a new and more peculiar sight could be seen. Just on the other side of a fence, a multitude of strange objects of all different shapes, colours and sizes zoomed across a concrete strip going out of view on either side. Hartosh pressed his face against the window to get a better look. However, the machine they were in turned away before he could see much more. Soon enough, they came to a stop, and the sound of the engines died down. Moments later, a mechanical whir could be heard coming from the back of the machine. The entire rear wall seemed to be slowly opening up. By the time it had stopped, the wall had lowered to the point where it now acted as a ramp. Their escorts, who were standing just outside, walked up the ramp to meet them. There was something about these soldiers that threw him off, however. These soldiers were dressed in a different pattern of uniforms than the other two varieties he'd seen. It was such a strange thing. Why have so many different uniforms? It seemed rather impractical and wasteful, though they may serve a purpose, much like the different coloured collars in their military. It was honestly hard to tell. He would have to ask about that when they could properly communicate. Their escorts led them to a large vehicle with a platform running along the back of it. One of the soldiers pointed to the vehicle and said a single word. Truck. Hartosh threw his pack into the back of the truck and quickly climbed in. After grabbing Chulkik's pack, Hartosh reached out his arm and helped him into the truck. Their escorts followed, climbing their way into the truck before one of the humans slammed on the cab. The truck's engine turned on. They began moving moments later. How far do you think we are from New Hope? Hartosh asked. It's hard to say. We were travelling for a few hours at great speeds, not to mention going over any obstacles that would slow us down. Chuluk had pondered for a second or two before speaking again. A few hundred miles, I suppose. We may not even be in the same empire anymore. Now and explain the different uniforms. Hartosh looked around as they drove through the base. They were seen to be more like a town than any base he'd seen before. The buildings themselves didn't seem too dissimilar to their own back home. They drove past many large buildings which appeared to be barracks. There were a large number of them, which made him guess that there were at least a few thousand troops here. Despite his estimate, there seemed to be almost no one around aside from their escorts and another vehicle that was training close behind them. Soon, they reached the end of the concrete road and turned off to a gravel one leading into the forest. After a few minutes, they arrived at a strange half-cylinder metal structure with a couple of guards on the entrance. 
The structure seemed to be quite old, rust coating a large portion of the outside. Despite the apparent age, it looked quite stable at least. The truck pulled to the side of the building and lurched to a stop. As Harsh Tosh hopped out of the vehicle, something in the forest caught his eye. A large bird with inky black feathers was quietly watching from one of the many treetops. Though it was small compared to him, it shared a similar figure as a Vik soldier. The little demon continued to stare him down as he walked to the building. Hartosh looked away as he reached the entrance, hoping that it would get bored and just fly away. One of the guards opened the door, revealing a dark and musty interior. There was very little light only coming in from the many small windows that ran along each wall. One of the escorts who followed them in clicked something that was on the wall. The room lit up soon after. Now that the room was illuminated, Harsh Tosh could see that the room was quite full of objects, but only a few of which he could recognise. Closest to them was an area with a couch and a bunch of strange devices. There was also a small bookshelf, though it would be a while before he could read any of it. Then there was a table with some chairs, and just beyond that was two beds, each having a footlocker. Well, at least it's somewhat spacious, Harsh Tosh said, trying to reassure Chulukik, though he may have said it somewhat to himself. It'll keep the weather out, that's certain. It had been several days since they arrived, and several days since they had any off time. Every day was working from dawn till dusk, only eating when they weren't sleeping or translating. It was slow and tedious. A couple days off was certainly welcome in Chulukik's mind. He took his time off inspecting the devices in the room, while Harshtop preferred to walk around outside. Chilukik fixated on one particularly peculiar device. It was square in shape and black with a panel that shone of glass, however felt too flexible to be such. A number of small buttons sat in the corner of the box. He pushed them one by one, none yielding results until he reached the last one. A small mechanical whir came from the device before the glass-like panel lit up, causing Chilukik to jump back a bit. The panel displayed a blue box with what looked to be some kind of text. It didn't last long, as it soon changed to something more discernible. It was a picture, rather a moving picture. It was as if the device had taken what someone was seeing and projected it right in front of him, almost like a window to somewhere completely different. The scene depicted three humans appearing to be caught in a storm conversing near a fire. Something that intrigued Lukic, however, was that one of them had a darker skin tone, similar to how Dakaran fur varied in colour. While Lukic's fur was a deep brown, some had more black or even grey fur. As the scene continued, the darker human spots something in the woods just beyond the light of the fire. Chilukik moved his face closer to the screen and squinted his eyes to just barely see something in the dark image. Suddenly, a large furry beast charged into view, causing both Chilukik and the human on screen to both jump back. Chilukik watched in horror as the animal bit into the human's leg and thrashed it around as a child having a tantrum would with a toy. The other two humans were only able to temporarily distract it with a burning log, before it went back to mauling its prey. Chilukik couldn't watch anymore, covering his eyes, but the screams of the poor human and the roars of the beast could still be heard. He had to make it stop. He could hardly think. He reached for the button, fumbling, as his eyes were still closed. After a few tries, he hit the right button, and the device turned off. Chilukik stared at the black screen in shock. He didn't know what the thing was, but he'd rather not find out. Deciding that he'd messed with the devices enough, Chilukik elected that it would be a good time to get some fresh air. Outside the morning frost still coated the ground, and it hadn't snowed here unlike where New Hope was. Chilukik thought perhaps it was because they were at a lower altitude. Harshtar was on one knee near the tree line looking at something. When Chilukik approached, Harshtar put his hand up, gesturing for him to halt. Shh, you're gonna scare him. Scare? Who? Harshtar didn't answer. Instead, he gestured for Chalukik to approach slowly. After getting close enough to peer over Harshot's shoulder, he could see a small black creature eating seeds off of the ground. It looked up at Chalukik for a moment before quickly going back to its food. Harshot poured some more seeds on the ground from his hand. Rukik. His name is Rukik. The mighty Vik killer Harshot makes friends with a bird of all things. It's been watching me every time I step out here. I figured it was hungry and would leave me alone if I fed it. Chulukik looked over at Harshtok, who was still staring intently at Rukik. So you gave it a name? Well, I started feeding him and I thought that I might as well give him a name, should he stick around. 
Chulukit walked to the side of Harshtog and sat down next to him. Chulukit spoke. We need to know what we can and can't tell the Ishvara about our home. We don't want them to know how weak we are until we're sure of their good intentions. I doubt we could do much even if we weren't, though I do think you're right. We'd have to post it as a trade deal, at least at first. Resources for food. They certainly have enough food from what we've seen. Hartosh dropped to a seated position. I looked over to Chalukik. How do you plan on getting military aid from them? That's the whole reason we're doing this, right? Um, well, that might be a little more challenging. Baby steps, Harshrock. We can't ask for the world right from the start. You seem to forget that every day wasted is more people that die for nothing. However we play this, we need to be as fast as possible. Remember, it isn't just our lives that are on the line. Without another word, Harshrock stood up and walked away. Rukik looking up at the leaving Dakar, then looked at Chalukik. They stared at each other for a few moments. I envy you. If only you knew just how hard things are. Rukik cooed in response before flying away into the woods. Open. Chalukik looked at the human doctor strangely. What did he mean by open? Could it be a translation error? Harshot spoke up. Your mouth. He wants you to open your mouth. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Chulukik opened his mouth as wide as he could manage. The doctor shone a small handheld light to inspect his mouth. Then he started to poke and prod with a small wooden stick, which made Chulukik feel a bit uncomfortable. After he was done with that, he sucked the light in front of his eyes, causing Chulukik to recoil a bit. Just when Chulukik thought he was done, the doctor grabbed a stethoscope and placed it on Chulukik's chest. The doctor shifted it around a bit before lifting up some fur and pushing the metal piece against scales. A shiver went up Chalukik's spine, and all the fur on his back stood up at the touch of the cold metal. The human went through a few more exams, all the while taking notes. When he was finally done, he closed his bag and shook Chalukik's hand. Thank you, Chalukik. My pleasure. As the doctor left, Chalukik slipped his shirt back on and turned to Harshok. That was quite the dreadful procedure. Did they do the same with you? Yes, well, for the most part. They weren't as gentle and didn't shy away from taking any sample they could get their hands on. Chalukik stood up, buttoning up his shirt. Speaking of which, I still need to write that letter to send with the food sample we're sending back. Maybe I'll write to a few different people. Do you want to write to someone back home? I doubt any of my family would care to hear from me. We haven't been on such good terms since I ran off to the army. Chalukik fiddled with a stack of fresh paper, grabbing the exact number of sheets he needed. He took the papers to a clear spot on the table and sat down. Chalukik tried to begin writing with one of the strange human pens, but it seemed to be malfunctioning as he was scribbling vigorously. Then he tried violently shaking it, which seemed to produce a desirable result, as he soon began writing with no issues. That's a shame. I hope you can make amends with them whenever this is all over. What about you? Surely you have more than your sister and your work. Chalukik looked up with a smirk. Don't forget Osiris. She's the closest thing I've had to a commitment. Been working on her for nearly 20 years. I should have figured as much. Maybe one day you upgrade from inanimate objects and get an actual woman. Chalukik replied with a snort before returning to the letter. Hartosh was about to say something when a tapping sound came from one of the windows. Something that had become common in the past few days. Rukit happily hopped in as soon as Harshtok opened the window and looked at him expectantly. Hartosh pulled out a piece of bread from his coat pocket and held it out in front of the bird, who nipped it up enthusiastically. Slowly, Hartosh reached towards Rukik's head and softly ran his fingers down the bird's neck, all the way to his tail. Rukik's feathers ruffled up a bit in surprise, but he seemed to enjoy the caressing after a few moments. He gave happy little coos as Harshtok petted him. Harshtok never had a pet before. They weren't very common even before things got bad, though he couldn't understand why. From what he could tell in the short time of having one, it was one of the best things in recent memory. It had been a fairly long day for Shilukik. The Vik had been making major military movements for the first time in years, and of course this had brought up questions about how many resources they had been putting into the portal. She could hardly believe that the Council were once again debating pulling the plug of the project again, especially while her brother was away on a diplomatic mission. That was one of the only reasons she still supported the project continuing. She would never abandon her brother in a foreign world, even if his antics were eccentric at times. That said, things did seem to be calling off over there, 
as there hadn't been any major reports of Isva, or rather, human activity. She just hoped that meant things were going well for him. At least all there was left to do for the day was read a few reports then, she could finally rest. Shilukik sat at her desk, which had a thankfully small stack of papers. Flipping through the first few, they all seemed pretty standard. Food shortages, casualty reports, increased budget requests, then one caught her eye. It was one about the Isva weaponry found on their crashed flying machine. Of course she was given a copy as a formality. Such matters were usually under military matters, which her husband would be responsible for. But out of curiosity, she opened the report and flipped through a few pages. All of the weapons seemed to follow a similar goal to Dakaran weapons. Shoot a projectile at high speeds to kill a target from range. However, the Isra weapons had a different way of forcing the projectile out. Instead of pressurized steam, they used a highly volatile powder that when ignited would react violently. The result was a much more effective punch, sending the projectile flying faster than sound itself. Shilukik had to take a moment after reading that. It was hard to believe that a little bit of explosive powder had that kind of power. She continued reading through the report. As a result of this unconventional propulsion system, the weapons were considerably lighter than any steam weapon, not to mention no need for a bulky and vulnerable steam core. Impressively, despite even the largest of their projectiles being a fraction of the size of a standard steam rifle round, the ballistics were leagues better, even the smallest of which performed better in almost all aspects. There were three variants of weapons found, a mounted weapon that shot a bullet similar in calibre to a steam rifle, but seemed to fulfil a similar purpose to a steam cannon, a handheld weapon that seemed to serve a similar role to the steam rifle, and finally, a weapon that could be held in a single hand, however its bullets were considerably slower, but it still retained impressive stopping power. The paper went into detail on how each one of them worked, all of them surprisingly complex. The paper also mentioned the use of materials and alloys previously unknown, which also contributed to them being lightweight. If they had access to the materials and tools needed to make these weapons, the Vik would stand no chance, or perhaps they could buy them from the humans. Replicating them would be near impossible without the powder, however. Shilukik wrote down a few notes to remind her of this subject. It could certainly be useful in the future. Maybe for the time being she could get her hands on one of the single-handed ones. She did like the idea of a pocket steam rifle. After she finished skimming through the rest of the reports, she found a letter below all the papers. Normally a letter wouldn't be unusual, but it was who it was from that caught Shilukik off guard. The letter was from Shilukik. She was more relieved than anything. This had to mean good things, how else would it have gotten to her otherwise? She quickly opened the letter and read through it, confirming that it was indeed good news. Shilukik stood and walked out of her door to her assistant on standby. Send word out to the council. I'm calling a meeting first thing tomorrow. The room was filled with conversation. While there were many different conversations, most of which were theorising why the meeting had been called. When Shilukik stepped into the room, everyone went quiet. Meetings on such short notice were rare, and usually meant something serious had happened. When she opened her mouth to speak, the breath seemed to be drawn from the chambers, as every council member braced for the surely dire news. Late last night, I received a letter from my brother, with news from the other side. I am greatly relieved to say that the word is good, and possible trade opportunities have already been discussed with the humans. A collective sigh filled the room, with nearly everyone wearing a face of relief, aside from the usual few that were strongly against the project from its inception. The good news did seem to quell some of the disdain, however. A council member wearing a general's uniform stood and began to speak. Has there been any discussion of potential military aid? Our army is stretched thin as it is, and new hope has only worsened the ever-extension. Gods forbid the Vik attack Earthlaunt. I doubt we'll be able to repel it full of sulfur long, nor without extensive casualties which we can't afford. The matriarch motioned the general to sit down before replying. As of yet, no, but my brother assures me that is one of his goals. For now we will have to make due with civilian trade. However, that does bring other concerns that should be discussed later. As soon as she finished speaking, another member stood up. I suggest that we send a reply at once. Chalukic should have no trouble translating it to the humans. Another one stood up. But how are we supposed to deliver this message? We don't even know where they are. Chalukic raised her hand, suddenly ordering everyone to cease speaking. Thank you, council member. I think an official reply would be the obvious next step. As for the matter of delivering the reply, 
I'm sure a messenger would have no trouble flagging down one of the human patrols. More importantly, what should our reply contain? The general stood again. They are clearly militaristic in nature. We should say that we require assistance in a war, but that we're not afraid of defending ourselves if it ever comes to that. Surely a response like that will earn their respect. One of the other council members that were still standing quickly retorted, No, that will only serve to provoke them. They will quickly catch on to our bluff. We should show our weakness, give them trust, and they will reciprocate the gesture, allowing us to be in good standing with them from the start. If we show them too much weakness, we'll only be putting a target on our back. They'll see us as an easy target and wipe us out. Shilukik spoke up, immediately silencing the room. Both strategies have merit, as well as their own disadvantages. I agree we shouldn't show any more weakness than we have to, but we must also earn their trust. We should find a good middle ground that everyone can agree on. Then the council member that had previously bashed Shilukik in the matter of giving her brother another chance with new hope stood up. We should send a message saying that we hope for peace and cooperation. They likely know that we do not pose much of a threat to them. Are we forgetting that they have captured some of our weapons when that scout was taken? If they wanted to wipe us out, and they know that they can, they would have done so already. The humans have the upper hand, and they know it. I believe they are a militaristic people, but a people that wish for peace and diplomacy. A few moments of silence followed. Everyone was too deep in thought to reply, or maybe they were thinking why they hadn't thought of it that way before. Slowly, murmurs filled the room, as the council members discussed the idea amongst themselves. Shilukik saw an opportunity to break the back-channel conversations and announced, Thank you, well said. I think that would be the best way of going forward. If everyone agrees, I will draft the letter today, and we can go about refining it at another meeting. A few more minutes of discussion later, and the council had come to a decision. The message was going to be a call for peace and cooperation, but with a statement that it would not shy away from a fight if the humans present one. Shilukik felt it was a good mix of the different ideas, and should earn some respect from the humans. Once the council dispersed, she retired to her quarters to begin writing the letter. As the sun rose, Enuek got out of his nest and freshened up. It would not do to have an inadequate plumage when presenting himself to his troops. After all, he had to lead by example. His nest, a circular pile of soft materials, would be taken care of by the keepers. He exited his chambers and headed to his office. Soldiers and workers saluted him as he passed. He returned the greeting only to those he felt deserved it, however. A pile of reports awaited him. They contained what happened during the night. In order to speed up the sorting of these reports, he had developed a system where they were colour-coded in the corner. Blue was something that could wait. Yellow was something of concern, but was not a priority. Red was a severe danger. Something that would end with spilled blood. As Emmett flipped through the pile to see if anything would catch his eye, someone burst through the door unannounced. Before he could even begin to ask what this was about, the messenger began screaming. Large contingent of soldiers marching our way! Enwek slammed his feathers on the desk. What? The soldier tried regaining some of his composure. They are coming from the east. Quick estimates put the enemy at least several thousand strong, sir. From the east? But that's a settlement under our control. How could they? Had the Takar marched out further east and began swooping in? What were the patrols and sentries doing? They would be held to pay after this was dealt with. Surely if these were friendly, someone would have sent a messenger ahead. Even more so, Veek flew, they did not walk. Now is not the time for hesitation. Preparations have to be made, he reminded himself. Lock it all down. Pull back the patrols and sentries. Let them siege us, that will buy us some time. Much of the pre-existing Dakar fortifications had been destroyed during the attack to take over the settlement. The Veek had, however, added wooden palisades to the otherwise plain settlement. Soldiers and others readied themselves for an attack. At this range, it would be foolish to try and take to the skies with so many possible Dakar and their dreaded steam rifles. Combat would be drawn out, and the Veek air superiority would sadly not help them. Their acidic spit, however, was still a strong weapon in close quarters. Enwed made his way up to the central watchtower. Although more exposed, it would allow him to have a view over the battle and send orders more effectively. The enemy was now within visual range, and something seemed off. The usual Drakkar outfit was not something like this. Dark, pointy shapes lined the front of the soldier's armour. The marching troops suddenly stopped and parted, letting a single figure pass between them. Curiosity turned to confusion. 
and then despair. A wave of panic surged within Equek, as some of his soldiers closest to the gate prepared to spit at the advancing figure. If he shouted from this distance, they may not hear him, or worse, misunderstand his words. Without another delay, Enwek nosedived off the watchtower, and propelled himself with full speed. Every fraction of a second counted, and so he did not even attempt to slow his fall, instead landing hard on his legs, eliciting grunts of pain from himself. The soldiers paused for a moment, turning to look at him. Gasping, the only words he managed to get out were, STAND DOWN! The whole settlement was now at a standstill. No one dared move a muscle, and all were waiting with bated breath. After a few seconds to gain his composure back, Enwek firmly ordered the nearest soldier, Open the gates. The soldier nearest to the mechanism to the gate stared in disbelief at Enwek, almost asking if he was serious. Seeing nothing happening, Enwek followed it up. Did I start a soldier? Enemies be damned, the soldier dutifully obeyed his officer's orders and began lifting the gate. The approaching figure was now merely a handful of feet outside of the gates, and Enwek let his right foot bend, kneeling down on one knee as his left wing was brought across his chest until it touched his right shoulder. Enwek's gaze fixated the ground as his lips trembled to get the words out. My liege. <laughs>